Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first of three webinars on financial wellness, all of which are sponsored by the NASDAQ Foundation. The focus of today's webinar is on women and money, and you are in for a treat today. My name is Linda Williams. I am a community outreach and training manager with Consumer Action and your host for the day. And on behalf of Consumer Action Executive Director Anna Flores and the entire staff at Consumer Action, welcome. I am so excited. I'm pumped. I'm excited about the conversation that we are about to have today. March is Women History Month, and I can't think of a better way to celebrate than to talk about how women, especially women of color, can use investing as a tool to build not just wealth, but generational wealth. So today we're gonna to have a conversation on various topics such as savings, how to find money to save, credit, the importance of having great credit, investing, letting your money pump that aren't work for you, retirement, and creating healthy financial habits. And audience, I can't think of a better person to have this conversation with during Women's History Month than our guest speaker today, the one and only Catherine Tuggle. Catherine has been in this space, the personal finance space for over 25 years. She is the Chief Content Officer and Gracie Award-winning Editor-in-Chief at Her Money. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Catherine later on, but for now, break out your pen, your paper, take that last sip of that coffee or a tea and buckle up, strap in, because we bring in the fire today. Now, before I get too excited, I have a few housekeeping items I need to take care of, and I need to update you on what's happening uh, at Consumer Action. Now, this is a nine-minute webinar. If you have any questions for Catherine, please put them in the chat box. Now, at the end of the of Catherine's presentation, my coworker Nelson Santiago, he's going to facilitate a question and answer segment. This is where we get to hear from you. So help us keep the conversation moving. Help us keep the learning process flowing with your questions. Put a ton of questions in that chat box for Nelson. Now the webinar is being recorded and it's gonna live in perpetuity on our YouTube channel. You will receive a link to the recording, the PowerPoint deck and all handouts by tomorrow afternoon. AFC professionals, you will receive the password to claim your 1.5 CEUs continuing education units tomorrow as well. Now, at the end of today's webinar, you will receive a survey regarding today's session. Please complete the survey and return it to us as soon as possible. In addition, for attending today, as a bonus, you will receive a certificate of completion. So how about that? Consumer Action is uh, presenting this webinar with uh, funding from the NASDAQ Foundation. So a special thank you and a shout out to the foundation for supporting Consumer Action and believing in our mission. Now, let me update you on what's happening at Consumer Action. For those of you who are new to Consumer Action and are wondering what do we do, we are an educational and advocacy organization. What do we do? As displayed there on the screen through education and advocacy, we fight for strong consumer rights and policies that promote fairness for all consumers, but especially for underrepresented consumers nationwide. Now, when you're on our homepage, you see that little burgundy looking link in the middle? Click on that burgundy button and you will land on our COVID-19 educational project page. There you will find uh, many relevant, easy to use resources and tools for the community that you serve. So please, when you're on the website, click on that link and take a look at uh, those resources that we have available for you. Now, uh, let me tell you about our latest project, thanks to NASDAQ. We have created easy to read, multilingual guides for consumers on investing, that's right. You can go to our website and you can download a free guide on investing that will provide you with information on why, when, and how much to invest. 
different types of investment, how to manage risk and investment costs and avoiding scams and fraud, and, and a ton of resources for learning more. And did I say the guides are free? Now, since women have additional challenges to overcome when planning for the future and getting started investing, we've created a multilingual guide just for women. And the title, Women, Take Control of Your Financial Future. This guide identifies some of the barriers that women face, and it also explains why women must invest, and it also offers tips and resources to help them uh, get started investing. Investing is a key to achieving long-term financial security and building generational wealth. But for a number of reasons, women and communities of color, they invest at a lower rate than other groups. So our multilingual guide for communities of color explain the barriers to investing for that community, as well as, well as why it is crucial for communities of color to start investing. It also offers tips on how to get started and uh, how to stay on track uh, once they begin investing. So how do we get, how do you get to these um, important guides? When you're on our website from my homepage, you can click on the training module under the quick menu as displayed on the screen, then select investing from the down drop menu and voila. You can print copies of the guides. You can share them with your clients, your family, your friends, your church group. I've downloaded, saved, and emailed copies of the guides to all of my adult children and my high school age grandkids. Why? Because it's never too early to uh, learn about investing. So when you're on our website, download the publications and share them with someone you love. Now, let me review the roadmap with you quickly so you know where we are headed today. We open each and every trainer, regardless of whether it's virtual or in person, with a game called How Much Do You Know? This is where we get to test your knowledge. So today we have three true or false questions. All of the questions were taken from the multilingual guide that I described. After the game, I will introduce you to our guest speaker. The question and answer segment led by Nelson Santiago will follow. I will come back tell you how you can donate to consumer action and wrap up. So let's start the true and false game. This is how the game is played. There are three true or false questions. First, I would read the question and you would use the chat box to answer each question, whether it's true or false. Then I will close the poll and we will take a look at the results and I will tell you whether the statement is true or false and why. So are you ready? Are you ready to go? And let me tell you this, the person with the most correct answers, drum roll please, he or she will walk away with the bragging rights to how much do you know? So let's roll out that first question. Question one, true or false? Money not invested loses purchasing power because the interest rate on savings accounts is lower than the rate of inflation. Is that true or false? Money not invested loses purchasing power because the interest rate on savings accounts is lower than the rate of inflation. Okay, wow. Okay, let's, let's close the poll and take a look at the results. Wow, 87% think that that is a true statement. 13% believes it's a false statement. Well, 13%, that's a true statement. According to page one of Consumer Action's uh, Multilingual Guide, investing gets started putting uh, your money to work for you. The statement is true, why? Well, according to the guide, unlike saving for a uh, short term, Investing for long-term financial guides like retirement allow you to focus on growing your money rather than keeping it liquid. And the example that's offered by the guide is if you were to put away $3,000 per year in a savings account, and that account was only paying like 1% uh, interest, you would have $67,083 after 20 years. But if you invested that money and if you only achieve a moderate rate of return, like say 
you will have $140,407 after 20 years. So my little young grasshoppers out there, let's start putting that $3,000 away and let's find a moderate rate of return. So in 20 years, you will have some money. Okay, let's move to the next question. You guys are doing good. You're doing great. Next question number two. True or false? Men and women face different challenges when it comes to their money. What? True or false? Men and women face different challenges when it comes to their money. Is that true or is that false? A couple of more seconds. Let's give it a couple of more seconds and I'll close the poll. Wow. Let's close the poll and take a look at the results. 95% of you believe that that is a true statement and only 5% thinks it's false. Well, 95%, you're absolutely right. According to our multilingual guide, investing for women, women take control of your financial future, that is true. A recent pay scale study found a 25.6 overall pay gap between men and women with men typically earning more. We'll hear a little bit more about this from um, our guest speaker, but that is a true statement. Wow. Audience, you are doing great. Let's move on to the last question. Okay. To build generational wealth, it's not enough to work and save. You must invest your money to make it grow. Is that true or is that false? To build generational wealth, it's not enough to work and save. You must invest your money to make it grow. I see you're trying to make up your mind. Okay. Let's close the poll and take a look at the result. Wow. 97% believe that is a true statement and only 3% thinks the statement is false. 3%, I'm sorry, all of the, the answers to the questions today are true. And this one is true as well. Um, and according to the Multilingual Guide, Investment for uh, Communities of Color Build Generational Wealth, it gives several examples of how you can build generational wealth. And according to the guide, the stock market is one way to create wealth over the long term. And why? Because it has the potential to grow significantly more uh, than the rate of inflation, which bounces back to our first uh, question. Family businesses also have the potential for growth. More than 30% of family-owned businesses transition to the next generation. Real estate is another significant way to build wealth over a long time through equity and uh, rental income. But as you will hear from our guest speaker, you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. Okay, so who is walking away with the bragging rights today? Who's walking away with the bragging rights today? Hit me up and let me know how you did on the, uh, the test. So for more information about uh, investing, go to our website and uh, download those multilingual guides. And like I said, share with your family and your friends and your church family, okay? Because if one succeed, we all succeed. Okay, audience, now let me introduce you to our guest speaker. And audience, if I had a music selection to play during this introduction, it would be, this girl is on fire, excuse the vocals. Catherine Tuggle is the Chief Content Officer and founding partner at Her Money Media. She has over two decades, two decades of experience leading teams in, in the national media, and Her Money is the third, the third media startup she has shepherded to success. She has co-authored the book, How to Money, and under Catherine's leadership, hermoney.com has won a Gracie Award for the best news website in 2021. In addition, Catherine often appears on national television network as a contributor, speaking to economic news, personal finance, and women issues. In addition, she's actively involved with the Native American Journalists Association. She's a certified yoga, a teacher who offers pro bono instructions to incarcerated women. Catherine, 
it is indeed an honor to have you uh, join us today. I've read your book on how to money. I know you have an entire presentation plan for our audience, but if you can, before you get into your presentation, if you could just take one little minute and explain to our audience what it means to know how to money. Let me well, give thank you so, thank you so much, uh, Linda. That was an amazing, an amazing introduction and quiz. I was enjoying participating in that. Um, yeah, you know, so Her Money, we are an organization. We are focused on bridging the gender and race gaps for women and women of color because for for far too long women have been behind the eight ball with investing and saving it was such a male dominated money was such a male dominated topic and industry and field for so for so long um that we we launched in 2018 to bridge those gaps and then last year our first book how to money came out and how to money is basically the book that we, my co-author and I, Jean Chatsky, we wish it was the book that we had been handed when we were first starting our financial lives. You know, it was kind of like the money guide that you wish your big sister had handed you um, before you got into debt and before you like failed to start saving on retirement. So we really wrote the guide that we wish we had had. And it is everything about saving, investing, um, budgeting just to make sure that you live a successful and empowered financial life. Um, and I think you told the participants today that we have some copies to give away, but um, I'm very excited to give a few copies out to people and uh, some Harmony t-shirts as well. <clears throat> Um, I think I, I, I'm guessing there was not a follow up question, so I will just go right into it, which is awesome. Um, yeah, so so basically her money, um, like I said, we are an organization um, devoted to bridging the, the gender and racial um, wealth gaps um, and uh, a little bit about us. We have free weekly newsletters, um, free financial advice. If you guys would like to sign up, um, it's harmony.com backslash subscribe. If you subscribe to us, you'll get um, sent our podcast uh, in the newsletter, or you can subscribe if you guys listen to like Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever you get podcasts, you can just search for Her Money and we'll come up. Um, one really cool thing that we do that we consistently hear is like our most popular um, part of our podcast is our CEO, Gene Chatsky, my co-author, uh, and I, we take listener questions. Um, so whatever question you have that you might want to ask a financial planner, or if you might have a budgeting question or an investing question, we take those questions um, every week on our podcast. So uh, people always love it. And sometimes we do bonus episodes of just questions because like it's it's so handy to like know that there's a resource for a financial question um, that doesn't involve, you know, working with a financial planner. Um, so if you guys have those, please, please send them our way um, at mailbag at harmony.com. The email address there is on the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> we also have a private Harmony Facebook group if you guys wanted to search um, Facebook for Harmony. And uh, I will I will let you into the group. But but that's really us. And, and we'd absolutely love to have you guys join us there. Um, so, um, as Linda said, and I said, the book is called How to Money. That's the cover of it. And it's just, it's truly a basic guide to all the main tenets of money management and investing. Um, and it's for everybody, regardless of gender. But like I said, we do focus a little bit more heavily on women just because women for years have been starting behind the eight ball um, on financial education. And we'll, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So today we're going to go through a little bit about the building blocks of financial success, which I think most of you know, given how stellar the performance was on the quiz that I just saw. Um, but essentially, uh, budgeting, living below your means, not spending more than you earn, paying down your debt and getting your credit score up, setting financial goals, having a plan and being able to take action, and investing for the future. And I think. I know that investing for the future, that last one, is what trips a lot of women up. Because like I said, the investing world has been locked off to us for so long. Um, so 
the the investing aspect is the one that we're going to spend the most time talking about today. <clears throat> but all of this, you have to talk about kind of all of this in synergy with one another, right? Because let's go back to the top with create, creating a budget. If you want to find more money to invest, you got to budget for it, right? If you want to have a successful budget where you're not in debt every month, you got to learn to live below your means, right? If you want to have more money to invest, you've got to pay down your debt so that instead of paying a credit card company, you can actually invest your money. Um, and how will you know what you want to do with that money once you've invested it? You've got to have goals. Um, and in order to get goals, you've got to have a plan and you've got to actually take those action steps. So, you know, just with this little framework, you can see how it's almost impossible to separate and talk about just one financial goal, which is why we wrote the book, which is why, you know, you have to talk about all of the, the financial efforts that you can make as one holistic picture. It's kind of like somebody going on a going on a diet but refusing to exercise, right? Like you've got to you've got to do both. You got to you got to have a complete healthy picture for your life. So the reason we're going to focus on investing today is the investing gap. We know the gender wage gap means that women earn on average 82 cents on the dollar for every every dollar that a man earns. That gap is far worse for women of color. Um, but there's also the investing gap, which we have to focus on, because when we do earn money, we, we already know we're earning less than men, but when we do earn our money, we are investing less of it. We invest 40% less than men on average. The little graph on the bottom of the screen shows investing confidence by gender, and we can see how 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 low our confidence is in investing compared to men. 54% of women say that they have a, a level of investing knowledge compared to 71% of men. Likewise, 34% of women feel comfortable making investment decisions compared to 49% of men. And once again, this is because men have had access to the glass towers of the financial world for longer than women have. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't need, we, we, you know, now we're in 2023, we got to do something about that. Um, so, you know, these are just some stats that I quickly pulled um, just to show you guys how, how vast this difference is. We see that um, the World Economic, Reform, Repo World Economic Forum reported that uh, women retire with 30 to 40 percent less money than men. And that figure alone is horrifying. But then when you consider that women live an average of five years longer than men, it's even more frustrating because we need more money than men. We absolutely need more money than men um, because of our longer lifespans. So, you know, all of these things like we were talking about just a minute ago about how you have to look at the complete financial picture, you know, uh, when you go in to negotiate for a raise with your boss, that negotiation is so incredibly important because earning more is the the path that you need to take to investing more. And when you can invest more, then you will have more money uh, to secure your financial future. So so all of these reasons, all of these these horrifying stats are why we're going to spend more time today talking about investing. So, so, you know, I don't know everybody's comfort level here with investing necessarily, but um, what I can say is that anybody who has a 401k or an IRA or any other retirement account, you are an investor. You might not realize it, but you are because those retirement accounts are invested in the market. Now, a lot of you, like me, you might do something where you set it and forget it, right? Where you invest in a target date fund that is like targeted to be ready for you when you hit retirement age. And that's fine, right? Like if that is all the investing that you do, that's amazing. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is how to be a little bit more empowered and understand a little bit more about what it means to to invest in the stock market, right? To to open a brokerage account and to put your money to work for you. 
Um, and there's an example that I always love of investing like baking bread. You put your dough in the oven, you expose it to heat, you wait, and eventually the dough will rise. But the oven is doing all the work, right? You're not doing the work. You did the work by certainly you, you know, you put together the dough and then you and then you turn the oven on. But while your bread is baking, you can just relax, right? And this is what we want our investing lives to be like. Like we can hustle in our nine to five, we can hustle in our side gig and we can earn that money. But the act of investing does not have to be a challenge. It does not have to be something that we have to think about and fret about every day. Our responsibility is to put that money in and then sit back and relax and know that we have secured our financial future. And to me, like, I got to tell y'all, like, I love doing things the easy way, like work smarter, not harder. That is me 110%. So for me, like the, like investing appeals to the lazy girl in me, right? Like I want my money to grow while I, while I focus on other aspects of my life um, for these next few decades until I hit retirement. So, um, you know, in our quiz earlier, we were talking about inflation and the goal of, of beating inflation. So I think that a lot of people, when they talk about investing, you think about having a lot of money in retirement, which is absolutely true, absolutely great. I invest so that I can have a secure retirement, like 100%. But the other two important things to look out here are we we really have to invest like yes we want to invest so that we can have like nice cruises in retirement but we also have to invest so that we can be inflation and i think now in 2023 is a perfect time to be talking about inflation because everybody's seeing it happen in real time you know we are living through an era of really really high inflation the last time i checked it was like seven percent and I think there are times in our country when we don't have inflation. And I think, uh, you know, there's probably a lot of young people who don't understand, who only just now understood what inflation is when they went to the grocery store and saw that their eggs were like $10 a dozen, right? And now they're like, oh, I understand what inflation is. But the truth is inflation can come at any time in our lives. And a big reason to invest is inflation. Because if you only put your money in a savings account, then inflation is going to eat away at your spending power. So if you have, you know, $100,000 in your savings account today, by the time you get ready to retire, that money could be only worth $70,000 in in tomorrow's dollars, right? So but if you invest, if you invest in the stock market where you're going to earn an average of 10% uh, a year, then then you can have a successful retirement when your money will grow for you. If you look at the bottom of the screen, um, you know you you can see if you invest five hundred dollars a month while earning a ten percent annual return, you would have more than three hundred and sixty thousand dollars in twenty years. And that ten percent annual return that's not made up. That is the average annual return in the stock market over the course of the last hundred years. So anybody who says investing in the stock market is risky, you can just give them that number. And we are going to talk about risk later today because absolutely there is risk. But if you are a smart investor, um, you know, you and you are willing to play the long game and you are willing to leave your money invested for 20, 30, 40 years, then you're going to be good. Um, so basically the reasons to invest beyond just having a successful retirement, we got beating inflation and then benefiting from the compound interest. Um, and compound interest is essentially what happens when you reinvest what you're earning. So in this example that I gave, if you have $100 and you invest uh, somewhere in the market, it's gonna earn 10% a year. At the end of the first year, you're gonna have $110, right? But then that next year, you're not paid interest on that $100, you're paid interest on that $110. And then the next year, you're going to be paid interest on a little bit more, a little bit more. And it kind of just snowballs until in 20 years, you would have $673 if you didn't add a dime. So that is the power of compound interest is that you just sit and let your money grow. And that's what I was talking about with the oven analogy of just sitting back and letting your bread bake. It's, it's the exact same concept. And I love it. I love the way it adds up. And I'm not necessarily a math person. 
but these are numbers that I can understand and these are numbers that make me really, really excited. Okay, so a little bit more, another example that I wanted to share with y'all. Um, first of all, I wanna say that there's no such thing as starting too late. Like however old you are on this amazing webinar, I want you to know that it is not too late for you to start saving and investing. But the sooner that you can, the better off you will be. Um, and these are some examples. Basically, we took three hypothetical women um, you can see uh, in the picture on the left, they are, they're very interested in how much they're earning. Um, but basically, hypothetically, we gave them investing $1,000 a month for 10 years, earning a 7% return. So we're, we're going to go with a more conservative return than 10% because the market doesn't always do 10%. It just is an average of 10%. And Kim gets started early. She saves from age 25 to 35. Kate gets started a little later. She saves from age 35 to 45. Callie is, is starting later and saves from 45 to 55. They put away $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year for 10 years. Okay, so then um, over the course of that 10 years, it would be $120,000. After that, they don't do anything. They just let the oven take over and bake the bread. But essentially, they all invest that same figure, $120,000. But Kim, because Kim got started from age 25 to 35, I could not believe these numbers, but Kim walks away with $1.4 million. Meanwhile, Callie saved the exact same amount, only she started saving at 45 years old instead of at 25 years old. And due to the power of compound interest, Callie only has $373,000 at retirement. Kate is somewhere in the middle, right? Kate is still in good shape with 734,000. But um, to me, I feel like, you know, when people talk about compound interest, it's usually in the abstract. Like, oh yeah, you got to invest to take advantage of that compound interest. And nobody, you know, when I wrote the book, this is an example from the book. And I wrote it because I wanted to like really, really show like what it actually does for you because um you know I would not have thought that the that the difference would be this extreme right is it a 20 year difference a 20 year difference and all and what it amounts to is a difference between three hundred and seventy three thousand dollars and one point four million dollars so you know like I said if you are currently 55 if you are currently 65 I do not want you to feel like the moment has passed for you, right? Because it is never too late to invest. But if you are young, I want you to study this number and I want you to really, really, really understand how in what incredible shape you would be in financially if you start today, right? I, I want this to be like the thing that inspires you to start today as soon as we are done with this webinar. And I'm gonna show you how in the following slides. So the other thing we gotta talk about before we get too excited and before we say, okay, I'm gonna throw absolutely every dime I make into the stock market, right? Because it ain't that simple. Because some of your money should not be in the stock market and that is because of risk, right? So everybody will have to decide whether to save their money or invest it. We always recommend at Her Money that everybody has an emergency fund. And this is money that can cover your rent, your car payment, your food, your medical expenses for a period of three to six months if you were to lose your job, right? That money should not be in the stock market because you might need it immediately in, emer in an emergency. And you don't wanna have to jump through hoops to take it out of the stock market or to take it out of your retirement accounts and possibly have to take it out as a loss, right? Whatever money you invest, you wanna be able to leave it there for 20, 30, 40 years so that you can be like the example we just showed um, of walking away with your $1.4 million. You wanna leave that money untouched. So for that reason, because you wanna leave your investments untouched, you have to decide how much you want to have liquid in a savings account in case of an emergency or for whatever you want to buy. So the, the bullet point at the bottom, basically, um, you know, if you need your money within the next three years, if it's money that you say, you know what, I might want to buy a new car in three years or money that I might want to 
buy a house in three years or money that I need for my emergency fund, that money does not go in the stock market. That money goes into the bank. If you know you're not going to need it for three or more years, then you can start to think about investing it, right? Um, so that's that's kind of the, the rule of thumb that we want to go by here. All right. So now we're going to talk about where to put your money once you do decide to invest it. And actually, let me just go back to this slide real quick, because I do want to say that because we are in an era of inflation and we do have higher interest rates right now, this is actually really good for people putting money into savings. Um, I don't know if any of you have experience with high yield savings accounts. Um, but they're abbreviated sometimes as HYSAs. Um, and all it means is a savings account that is paying really high interest. But right now, because we are in an era with high interest rates, you can earn as much as 4% in a high yield savings account. So um, it's not always going to be that way. It's not always going to be that advantageous to you to have your money in a savings account because a lot of savings account earns 0% interest. But I do want to say, if you guys do want to have your money in a savings account, or if you want to have your emergency fund in a savings account, that now is the time to get some really good interest rates on a high yield savings account. And um, my favorite site to, to find out the best rate that I would qualify for is bankrate.com. It's B-A-N-K-R-A-T-E, just bankrate.com. And you can just search, if you want to search on Google, like the best the best rates for high yield savings accounts on Bankrate. And um, Bankrate will show you where you can get the best deals. So all that to say, if you have money in savings, that money in savings should be earning interest right now. That money in savings should be earning about 4% interest. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about, we'll talk more about investing, but I just wanted to say that about savings accounts. Okay, so we covered savings account. Now we're going to talk about where to invest your money. So you guys may have been intimidated by investing. I certainly know that I was when I was like new to the investing world. Like investing seems to encompass a lot of things. There's stocks, there's bonds, there's ETFs, there's mutual funds. And because there's so many places to put your money, it can honestly be really intimidating as a first time investor. So I think the most common thing, the most common place that people hear about investing in is stocks. And stocks are just essentially a small piece of a company's business. And once you invest in a stock, you become a shareholder because each little stock that you buy is called a share. Um, stocks are traded on exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. And when people talk about the stock market, they are talking about those markets. They're talking about the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, or any of the other markets. When people say the markets are down or the markets are up, that means that these exchanges where people trade stocks are either doing well or they're doing bad. Um, and, and shares are priced individually and they're based on the health of the business, how well the business is doing and what other people are, are willing to pay. Um, and I, I think, you know, this is pretty basic, but essentially if, if your company doesn't do well, the share price will go down and you'll lose money. And then if things go up, then you, the stock price will go up and you'll make money. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys follow the, the stocks app on your phones. If you have an iPhone, I know it's just called stocks. But if you have a company that you're interested in, you can track their little ticker symbol. Um, my favorite is the is Harley Davidson. Their ticker symbol is hog, like a hog, like a pig, um, which I think is just hilarious. But there's all kinds of, of funny uh, of funny ticker symbols out there. So um, if even if you if even if you're new to investing, you can appreciate some of the cleverness of these little of these little stock symbols. Okay, so so when we were talking about all the different places to invest and how that can be intimidating, the good thing is if you do invest in a lot of different things, you are diversified and that is what we want. We want to be diversified. Um, diversification is the most important way to protect yourself from losses. You should spread your money across lots of different investments. 
you should never have all your investment money in like one basket. Don't have your all your eggs in one basket. I think we've probably all heard that old phrase from our moms and grandmothers. Um, but basically, when you diversify, you are less exposed to the ups and downs of any single company, right? Like we just heard about all the bank failures these last couple of weeks. Well, those banks, those banks had customers and the customers got their money back. But those banks also had investors. Those banks had people who invested in that bank um, and those investors did not get a dime back. So if any one of those investors, if, if all they had said was, you know what, I really believe in this bank, I'm gonna put all my savings into this bank, um, those people would not have a dime to their names right now. So this is the importance of diversification. So if one company that you have invested in fails, you won't even necessarily lose money in your account when you look at your portfolio because even if one company lose money there's a really good chance that a different company did really well so this is why we want to stack our portfolio with a lot of different things we want to have tech companies we want to have industrial companies we want to have creative companies or clothing companies we want to make sure that like no matter what happens to any particular industry that we're still secure Okay, so speaking of diversification, we've got mutual funds and index funds. And mutual funds and index funds are kind of the perfect instantaneous way to get diversification. A mutual fund is kind of like a variety pack of stocks sold in a single bundle. For some reason, when I think of mutual funds, I think of like those old school, like little mini cereal boxes that used to come like shrink wrapped together, like a tiny little box of, frosted flakes and a tiny little box of rice krispies and like all all stuck together i used to love those as a kid my mom would never let me have them because they were like twice as much as a regular cereal box but anyway i kind of weirdly think of a mutual fund as being like this cereal variety pack of featuring multiple different stocks that i can buy and try and see what does well an index fund is kind of the same thing um, but it only contains companies that are part of a single stock market. So like you could get an index fund that mirrored the Standard & Poor's 500 and the Standard & Poor's 500 is 500 of the largest U.S. companies. And then that would instantaneously diversify you because your stocks would mirror the Standard & Poor's 500. Um, so no matter which way you go, mutual fund or an index fund, you will be instantaneously diversified. Um, my retirement portfolio, just FYI, is in a mutual fund. Um, in the bullet under mutual funds, I talk about a target date fund. And a target date fund looks at your age and it predicts how many years you are away from retirement. And it basically adjusts your holdings based on that. So like somebody who is ready to retire at 70, at age 68, they're probably not gonna be taking a lot of risk. You know, they're not going to be invested in a whole lot of risky stocks because they're two years away from retirement. But somebody who's in their 20s, somebody who's in their 30s is able to take a lot more risk because they don't actually need that money for like 50 years. So that's what a target date funds. It kind of a, a target date fund does. It adjusts over time for what your needs are. I'm in a target date fund. I love it just because I don't have to think about it. Okay, then we have ETFs and bonds. Um, an ETF is like a mutual fund. Basically, it trades like a stock on the stock exchange. So you can actually see ETFs on the same trading platforms that you trade stocks. Um, and people love ETFs who are investors because they can, like if you open a brokerage account to trade stocks, which we're gonna talk about those in a minute, like you can just buy and sell ETFs like you would any other stock, which is kind of great. Um, and mutual funds, my retirement portfolio is with mutual funds and because I have you know several thousand dollars in that account I don't have to worry about the minimum but if you're new and you want to invest in a mutual fund you should know a mutual fund has a $500 minimum investment ETFs don't have that minimum so for that reason I think a lot of people have just started going to ETFs because they don't have a minimum um, and then bonds we've heard a lot about in the news lately um, a bond is essentially a loan to a corporation. Like when you when you put your money into savings at a bank, you're, you're loaning your money to a bank. A bond is the same thing, only it's a loan to a corporation or a government. 
Um, and bonds are more stable than stocks. I know my grandmother was big into bonds because of their stability. I feel like bonds are like kind of tried and true. They've been around forever, but you should know because they are lower risk, you do not stand to earn as much. Um, I looked it up and a 30 year bond um, pays around 4.27% interest um, compared to the average of 10% return in the stock market over the last hundred years. Um, the thing about a bond is you know exactly how much you're gonna earn. Um, like I said, super, super stable, but given the fact that we are currently at 7% inflation right now, the, you can see that that 4.2% yield on a bond, a bond is not gonna outpace inflation. The only investment that we have right now that is outpacing inflation is investing in the stock market at 10%. So it's fine to have some bonds, but I definitely would not recommend having everything in bonds because like I said, they're not gonna earn quite as much for you. Okay, now we're gonna get to the good part, the how to invest. I'm going to take a sip of water. You guys can look at this lovely lady. This lovely lady, the diversified lady here. She's also apparently at her local bar playing darts. Um, but basically what you need to get started, you got to open a brokerage account. In order to open a brokerage account, you got to have at least $1. I really, really want you guys to feel excitement with this stuff. I want you to feel happy about investing because I think for far too long women have been disempowered with matters of money particularly women of color and I think that like the the white men in their glass tower institutions would love nothing more than for us to continue to feel that way forever so when I started my investing journey I felt for the first time that I was taking my economic power back and to me, I feel like I'm trying to erase any sort of intimidation I had about investing from years past. And I'm trying to fully embrace like the joy that that will bring when in 20, 30 years, I'm like sitting on a pile of money that, you know, the women who came before me were not allowed to own. So, you know, for me, I, I really hope that you guys see this as an exciting journey and not anything to be scared about because there's so many resources out there now. Like I'm just one resource sitting here talking to you today. There's so many ways for women to be empowered now. And the last thing is a willingness to stick with it because like I said, it's it's a journey. Okay, so, so this is what we talked a little bit about um, with opening a brokerage account. And you might have heard the term a brokerage account. It is nothing to be scared of, but it is going to be the place where you access the stock market, the place where you have access to buy the ETFs and the stocks that we just talked about. I want to be clear that a brokerage account is a totally separate thing from having a 401k or an IRA where you are invested with your retirement, right? Your 401k and your IRA is maybe through your employer, maybe you opened it up on your own, and that would be the account where you can um, invest in some mutual funds or some stocks, and that account you are not gonna touch until you retire, the 401k and the IRA, because if you, owe, if you touch the money in your 401k or your IRA before you hit retirement age, you'll have to pay a penalty. Um, so this account, your brokerage account, is gonna be really where you learn about the market. The brokerage account is gonna be where you get to pick individual stocks, you get to pick ETFs, and you get to really kind of play around and feel out what it means to be an investor. And maybe some of the money in your brokerage account you want to have waiting for you in retirement, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can be investing money in your brokerage account that you might wanna take out in three to five years to buy a house or a car. You could have money in your brokerage account that you want to take out in 10 years to pay for a master's degree or a trip around the world or whatever it is. So, so I like to think of a brokerage account money as money that I need for my future, possibly for retirement. But unlike a 401k and an IRA, if I need to take my money out of my brokerage account, there are no penalties, which, which is I love. There's, there's a feeling of freedom with that. So um, you guys may have made note of, of some of the discount brokers, um, but we really like 
Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, Betterment, Wealth Trade, Wealthfront, sorry, E Trade, Ally, and Robinhood. Of these, I have heard that Schwab is maybe the easiest to navigate. Just FYI, I don't, I don't necessarily um, know about the others. I find Schwab easy to navigate. I've also heard good things about E Trade. Um, and Vanguard, but I think if you're just getting started, any of these would, any of these would be a great choice, but possibly Schwab is a little bit easier for the novice. Okay, so once you open that brokerage account, wherever you decide to, to open it, you'll be ready to invest money, um, but you got to get money into that brokerage account. And I don't know if everybody here does online banking, um, but the easiest way to get money from your checking or your savings account into your brokerage account is just an electronic transfer. Um, you can literally just set up like a little transfer from your bank account to go into your brokerage account. And you can set this up like at your brokerage. Like, I'm gonna go back. So I know, I know Schwab and Fidelity and E-Trade and Vanguard, I think they have locations around the country. Um, and I know for a fact, if you go like on site and you tell them, I wanna help, I wanna set up an account, they will actually walk you through it like on your phone or your laptop and show you how to get your money transferred. So that's just something that you could do, or you could talk to them over the phone. Like everybody's always happy to help over the phone, but essentially you're gonna electronic transfer your money from your bank account into your brokerage account and then and then you are ready. Um, I, I put a note at the bottom because I've actually heard that a few people will have their money transferred into their brokerage account, and then they'll say, "Okay, I'm done. I have my money in my brokerage account. Like I'm invested." And that's not true. You actually, once your money is in your brokerage account, you have to decide which stocks you want to buy. Um, and it can be a little confusing at first, but you have to actually say, you have to press the button and say, "Okay." I'm going to select my stocks now. I'm going to select my ETFs. I'm going to select my funds. And only once you, you know, select buy and click buy on the funds or the stocks that you want to buy, are you actually invested? Um, and then if you sell an investment, right, if you buy a stock and you sell it, then that money just goes back to kind of like sit in the cash section of your brokerage account, right? So, so if you're buying and selling, you got to make sure that like, you got to make sure that you're buying and selling and that and that you're actually invested in the things that you want to invest in. Okay, well I kind of just talked about this, but basically um making your first trade, like I said, you got to make sure that once the money's in your account that you have enough money to cover at least one share or the stock of the ETF that you want to buy, right? So if you just want to get your feet wet and you know that like um, you just want to buy one share of Etsy. I was just looking at Etsy the other day um, because I, I just love like homemade stuff. And uh, I think Etsy has a really cool business model. But um, a share of Etsy right now is at $105.34, right? So let's say I just want to see how this app works. I'm new to this app, new to investing. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure in my account I have at least $105.34. I'm gonna click and I'm gonna click buy a share of Etsy and then that's it. I'm there and I can just kind of watch it. I can watch the ticker. I can see what the stock does. Um, but unless, you know, if I had only $75 in my account, it's not gonna work for me to buy that share because that share is $105. So, you know, you can't break your account you can't break your bank account. Like I really encourage you just plunking around, experimenting um, and seeing how it feels to you. Because like I said, there's nothing more empowering than starting that investing journey. Um, so one thing that has been a big topic in recent years, and I'm very thankful that it has, is how to invest in causes that you believe in. I talk to women every day who say, I am not going to invest in oil and gas companies or I am not going to invest in any company that has anything to do with firearms 
or I'm not going to invest in a company that, you know, has a reputation for polluting the environment. Whatever it is, if you are investing with your conscience, that is called socially responsible investing or ESG investing, which is environmental, social, and governance. And essentially, it allows you to invest your money with the causes you care most about. And I know for a fact that Fidelity, one of the brokerages that we mentioned, Fidelity actually has an ESG fund. So if you say, I want to make sure that any company I invest in is treating the environment well, I want to make sure that they're hiring women, I want to make sure that they're promoting women of color onto their board, then you can actually just invest in one of these funds. Um, and Fidelity's ESG fund is really, really popular. They've put a lot of work into it. So this is one way that you can make sure that when you are investing the money that you have worked so hard for, that it's being put to use in a way that you would respect and be honored by. Okay, we got the FIRE movement. Somebody call 911. So you guys might have heard of FIRE. It's, it's, it's gotten a lot of like press. A lot of people have talked about it on podcasts. Um, it stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. And those, the FIRE people are literally doing everything that we have talked about, but they're like doing a lot more of it. They are saving as much as 50 to 70% of whatever they're earning. And their goal is to be able to quit their jobs like as soon as possible. Like we've heard of fire people who are quitting their jobs at like 40 because they started working at 20 years old and they're just investing every penny that they can. Now I'm gonna tell you right now, this has not been realistic for me because I live in New York City and you know i worked as a journalist for a lot of years and journalists do not make a lot of money but like god bless if you're an engineer or something and you're earning a lot of money and you're able to live at home with your parents for a few years i can see this being i can see this being realistic um and really you know the fire math is thankfully very specific you are said to have achieved fire when you have saved 25 times your annual expenses right so this this works because of the four percent rule with the assumption that if you invest the money you've saved in a diversified portfolio you should be able to withdraw four percent a year pretty much indefinitely because we know that the stock market is going to pay around ten percent a year so so you know fire absolutely can be done and this is a beautiful goal i find the people who've done it to be very impressive um, and it really, it just speaks to the power of compound interest that we talked about early on. Okay, then these last few, few slides, I'm going to wrap it up and then we can take questions because I'm sure you guys have some. But, you know, a big question that we hear after we talk about investing and how great it is and how amazing it is, is I'm just not earning enough money. I am not earning enough money to invest you know, the money that I need to ensure a secure retirement, which is why one of the sections of our book is about starting a business or a side hustle, because we know that a lot of people are going to need that income on the side in order to reach their goals. Um, so we got open an Etsy store. You could run a business as a freelancer. I know a lot of us have writing, photography, graphic design skills. Um, some of us work for like Uber Eats or operate as some other type of gig worker, maybe a task rabbit situation, um, or maybe we rent out a home on Airbnb. But these are all like viable options that were available to us that really weren't available like 10 years ago because the internet has changed the game. And I find, you know, I'm, I'm leaving a lot on the table. There's so many different ways right now to be like a gig worker and a freelancer. Um, and I'm sure you guys have some pretty incredible skills that skills that you might not even know that you have that people need. Um, here's a list of some of the most important questions to ask before starting a business, because one thing you don't want to do is to spend a bunch of money to start a business only to find out that there's no demand for it or that it's not what you thought it was going to be. Um, what do I want to create? Is it a product or a service? Do products or services similar to mine already exist? What are they? Is my product or service different or better? And if it's not better, why do I think the world needs what I have? You know, these, these are important questions. 
What are other similar products or services charging? How much money and time is it gonna cost me to get started? Who are my customers? And is it gonna be easy for me to reach them? And then how much time do I have to, to really run this business? You know, if I'm already working a nine to five, am I realistically gonna be able to give this 15, 20 hours a week? You know, we have to be honest with ourselves. I think as a woman, particularly, I feel like I'm always biting off more than I can chew in my week. So we, we got to be able to make sure that we have um, a strong foundation before we go into a business. Um, and then customers and cash, you know, um, it, you got to spend money to make money is something I have always heard. But how much are you really going to need? You know, if you are, for example, going to open a yoga studio you are gonna need thousands of dollars to possibly renovate a space, rent a space, take out ads on the internet to promote your services. Um, but if you're gonna go into business making homemade granola, it might not be that much, right? You might have a nice kitchen facility. You might have your mom who can help you stick little labels on your bags of granola. Um, you, you might have, you might only be out, you know, $500 to start up that business. So you gotta look at what your startup costs are gonna be. Um, and then when you're ready to launch, before you're ready to launch, you kinda need to think about where your customers are gonna come from, you know? And that was part of those questions that we just asked, right? Are you gonna go local? Are you gonna try and sell in stores? Are you gonna market, you know, maybe you're a really good essay writer and you might wanna market your services on high school campuses to help edit people's essays who are starting into college. Like there's all kinds of things to think about, but you gotta know where your customers are coming from and how much startup capital it's gonna cost you. And once you have those two questions answered, I think you, you can really feel confident in getting started to, to earn that extra money that you need. And uh, here we are at two o'clock. Um, that is that is a wrap for me. Um, once again, the company um, that, that I run with my colleagues is called Her Money. We would love to have you as part of our little Her Money family um, listening to our podcast and sending us questions. Um, and I am I am always here to answer questions as well. Linda can connect you with me when this is over. And um, I would love to take any questions from, from the group today. Catherine, thank you for that um, excellent presentation. Nelson, I know you have a ton of questions for a uh, ton of questions for Catherine, right? Yes, Linda, we definitely have a lot of questions. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Go ahead. Well, great. And yeah, you know, we, we have a series of different uh, types of questions, but let me throw this one out first. It's one of the questions we got early on. Uh, what about for people who feel, you know, they want um, they want to invest money now and, and use it now or use it soon because they think maybe they're not going to make it to retirement. Where where will all that, if, if they spend, they don't make it to retirement and put everything inside for retirement and don't make it, where's that money going to go? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good, a good question. Um, so retirement accounts are really kind of sacrosanct like retirement accounts if you're invested in a 401k and an ira you can't touch that money until you reach retirement age or you will pay a penalty right so so i would say save there for for the money that you want to have for a rainy day in retirement but anything that you want before then I would recommend the high yield savings accounts that I mentioned, which are now paying 4%. There's bonds that we talked about. There's money market accounts. They, they, money market accounts are kind of similar to the high yield savings account rates um, and they're FDIC insured. Um, so, you know, I would say, I would say I live my life with the expectation that I am gonna make it to retirement age just because I think I am, I am, my grandparents did, my my mom and dad did, you know, thank God. Um, so so I do have money there, but I also have money in the brokerage account. And and you know, this whole the whole thing I talked about with the brokerage account, having money in that brokerage account is the perfect place for it because you can take that money in and out anytime without penalty. So the only thing that you can really mess up here is if you only invest in a 401k and an IRA, and then you need that money at 40, and you gotta pay a penalty to take it out. 
So, so wherever you invest, if you're not investing for retirement, make sure that there's, you know, make sure that you're not investing in an account that has a, an early withdrawal penalty. Great. Thank you. And then uh, we had a question here and including a comment about how, you know, if you have 20, 30, 40 years, that's fantastic, right? You have the time to, to earn, uh, earn some money on, on your investments. Um, but so if you are older, um, you talked a little bit about that, but for example, in the example you gave with, uh, I think Kim and Kate doing better than, I think her name was Kaylee. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> how, how does Kaylee try to catch up to one of them? Or, or do they just have to save longer? Do they have to put in double, triple what the others are putting? How do you catch up? Yeah, I mean, so I would say that if you are starting later, you you would ideally be able to save a little more than the person who is just starting out at 25. And ideally you will be able to, because when you're younger, your salary is gonna be a lot older than when you're in your 40s and 50s. By the time we have a career in our 40s and 50s, we are earning more per month. Um, so I would say just put aside more and you know wherever you have your retirement account or your brokerage account, you can get a broker on the phone. You know, you can get a, a fund manager on the phone and you can really ask them like, what are the best places for me to be invested now if I am gonna retire in 10 or 20 years, if I am gonna retire in five years? And they'll be able to advise you. And once you get to retirement, we didn't go into it today. I would be happy to come back and go into it on, on another day, but there's all kinds of retirement strategies that you can use, right? Like when you claim your social security can make an impact on how much money you're able to take from social security per month you know when we get older we might have um, real estate that we could rent out to earn extra money we might be in such a position in our career that we can take on a consulting gig that would pay a lot of additional money so like by the time you get to retirement, I do think some of these questions will answer themselves because you will have at that point so much more experience and so many different accounts to pull from. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Catherine. Uh, and someone is asking, would you suggest uh, paying, paying down debt, paying off debt before starting to invest? So I think it depends on the debt. I think if it's credit card debt, which is going to be costing you an average of like 20% per year, absolutely just go hard on that debt, hammer on that debt until it's gone. Because if you're investing in the stock market and you're earning 10%, but your credit card debt is costing you 20%, like the math ain't mathin', you know, like you've got to make sure that your debts are paid down before you can really start to feel good about your future. So yeah, if it's student loan debt, student loan debt is, or if it's mortgage debt, those are considered quote unquote good debt, right? Like those are debts that are not that high of an interest and they don't necessarily negatively impact your credit score as much. Those I would say pay those debts down in tandem with saving for retirement. But if you have credit card debt, I would try to get that paid down first. Great, thank you. And then we do have questions from folks asking about CD, using CDs again. You know, now that interests are going up, should you use CDs? Um, do you have any specific examples of high yield savings accounts uh, and a little bit more on bonds in the current climate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the website I mentioned to see the best rates. Um, that you qualify right now is bankrate.com and you can just google for best cd rates or best high yield savings account rates with bankrate and bankrate will send you to a page and you can actually um like it'll it'll actually show you the rates that are available right now in real time today and you can click on it and see which one you qualify for um but like i said the the money market accounts the CDs and the high yield savings accounts, the most that we are seeing on all of those right now is about 3%, or, sorry, 4%, my bad. Um, so essentially with a CD, like you won't be able to get your money out for the life of the CD, which is fine. But if you think that you might need to get your money out before that one year term or that three year term is up of the CD, 
you're better off just putting your money in a high yield savings accounts because the interest rate is going to be about the same, right? And these things are changing every single day. Like you can go to bank rate today and you might see a different rate available from bank rate than you're going to see tomorrow. Um, so, you know, it's really a question of, of how quickly you need your money. Um, but CDs, bank, uh, money market, and high yield savings accounts are all paying about 4% right now. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And then getting back into some of these investments, uh, somebody mentions if you could talk, ask us if you could talk a little bit more about how maintenance fees can eat into your profits. They mentioned, for example, mutual funds that charge very high maintenance fees. Uh, and maybe there's a difference between the actively managed ones and, and, and the passive ones. Uh, and then comparing that to EFTs, index funds, mm -hmm. EFTs and index funds. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't necessarily feel that the maintenance fees on mutual funds are too much. The average maintenance fee on mutual funds is about $20 for the year. Um, so, you know, I think if you're, if you feel that your fees are exorbitant, then I might go ahead and talk to your fund manager and, and make sure that you're not being ripped off or that you're not accidentally paying a fund that you shouldn't be paying. Um, but fees in the financial world often hinge on who is managing your fund. So when we were talking about um, ETFs and index funds, index funds are way cheaper than a mutual fund because index funds are just automatically generated, right? All that, an index fund is just a robot, like matching your stock investments to the same stocks that are featured in that index. So there's not necessarily a person that is like in control of that account. But a mutual fund is gonna have a lot more fees because a mutual fund actually has a fund manager. There is a man or a woman who is like actually picking those stocks based off of risk and market fluctuations and whatnot. So that's why you see the mutual funds have a fee. I personally think that the fee I pay for my mutual fund is totally worth it because I like knowing that there is a person who has oversight over my money. Um, but like I said, if you if you look at your account and you see that those fees are exorbitant, you should definitely call and make sure that that what you're seeing is accurate. Great, thank you. And then as um, people are considering, you know, looking at the, the list of potential brokers, uh, brokerage firms that you had, uh, somebody mentioned here, your bank also may be affiliated with, with a brokerage firm. Uh, they mentioned, you know, maybe B of A is with a particular firm, Wells Fargo with another. Uh, is that also where you may want to compare the, you know, like, say the percentage of, of fee, the fee percentage yeah. compared yeah. to other brokers? You should always, always be shopping. Um, it, it's definitely a lot easier if your bank has a brokerage arm because the, that automatic, your money will just automatically go back and forth between your bank account and that brokerage. So, so they definitely make it easy on you, um, but absolutely compare fees. It's kind of like buying insurance, right? Like the same, the place where you get your car insurance is not necessarily gonna have as good of a deal, uh, the best deal on life insurance, you know? You might wanna shop around. So it's just it's just like groceries, right? It's like anything else that you buy, you got to look around and say like, what is the what is the bottom line of what I'm going to be paying at the end of every single year? Great, thank you, Catherine. Uh, we did get a, a handful of questions related to taxes. Uh -huh. When do you pay for taxes? How how do these investments affect taxes? When do you have to claim profits and losses? Um, you know, what taxes are, are there if there are gains and does it matter where your money is in terms mm -hmm. of what the answer is? Yeah, so so there is there there is capital gains tax. So, so let me just say that if you are invested in a retirement account and you are not gonna touch that money until retirement, you do not have to worry about taxes. That money is just gonna ride and the oven is gonna bake the dough and you, you will think about taxes once you hit retirement and start withdrawing. But if you are taking money out of your brokerage account and buying and selling stocks, there is something called capital gains taxes. If you hold a particular stock for less than one year, you're going to pay what's known as short-term capital gains. Um, 
if you if you keep your stock for longer than one year, which I would recommend, you pay long-term capital gains taxes because long-term capital gains taxes are are better. Um, the long-term capital gains rate um, right now for stocks that you own for longer than one year is uh, between 15 and 20 percent, depending on your income. So that was long-term capital gains. Um, that for stocks that you hold longer than one year, you were going to pay 15 to 20% when you cash out. Short-term capital gains are the same as your ordinary income tax rates. So if you pay, let's say you're in the 33% tax bracket and you sell a stock after owning it for less than one year, you're going to pay short-term capital gains rates at that 33% rate. Um, just as if it were income, right? But but I think that people get too hung up on the taxes, right? If I may, if I invest really well and I earn a hundred thousand dollars and I sell that stock after two or three years, I have to pay 20%. But I'm still left with 80 grand. Like, did it suck that I had to give away 20 grand? For sure. Yeah. I wish I could keep it all, but like, what's the alternative? Not investing anything <laughs> because then I haven't earned anything. So, you know, I see capital gains taxes as a necessary evil, but like, you got to get in the game. You, you got to get in the game. It's the same thing as income tax. Do I wish the government would like not tax my income? Absolutely. But like, it is what it is. Great, thank the, thanks, that makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> now, in terms of what to invest in, if somebody is just getting started, do they have to think about what individual stocks to buy and where do they uh, where do they get some answers on that and also, or advice on that? And also, are there things to look out for? Like, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin and other things like that? Yeah, um, so in terms of, of advice on stocks to buy, I will say, that um, her money, we actually just started last year. We started an investing club for women um, and it's called Investing Fix. So um, if, if you go to her money, you will see that we do have the you know options to join Investing Fix. And uh, once every two weeks we meet and we talk about like stocks to buy. Because once again, we saw that women just did not have this knowledge and we wanted to get this knowledge into the hands of more women. Otherwise, in terms of what to buy, I would say a lot depends on your circumstances and investment goals. Like, you know, it depends on what you want. Like if you say, I really want to earn as much as possible over the course of 10 years so that I can like increase my down payment on a house, then, you know, you might want to look at like high growth stock opportunities. And I love resources like CNBC and Yahoo Finance and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times or groups like the Investing Fix Club that we that we just launched where we talk about everything. Um, but but in terms of advice on which stocks to buy, a lot goes into it. You got to look at the company's financial health, the company's management team, the company's industry. Like, I don't know that right now is a great time to be investing in tech companies because we've seen a lot of layoffs in the tech sector. So if now is not the right time to be investing in tech companies, maybe it's the right time to be investing in real estate companies because we know real estate is really big right now. So, you know, you, you got to kind of watch the markets and, and see and see where things are headed. But but I'm really encouraged with the number of educational resources there are. Um, you know, like I said, CNBC, Yahoo Finance, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. We'd love to have you in the Her Money community. And then, you know, there's all kinds of investing books and investing guides. Oh, you know what? There's also a woman I adore and she runs a, a company and a platform called My First 100K. Um, and it's it's basically all about her investing journey and she does a lot about investing on her website and her podcast i think it's maybe called her first 100k it's either her first 100k or my first 100k and she's awesome great thank you catherine and then what about this this uh you know you hear about bitcoin and and other 
other types of you know that, that kind of investment supposedly right. is it is it always is it something to be cautious about any thoughts on that um i am not a fan of anything crypto i think it is a little too speculative i think it's it i think it's too risky for me um but i am a little bit of a of a, of a safer investor um like just with bitcoin like over the course of the last five years bitcoin has gone from like sixty thousand dollars a coin to five thousand dollars a coin and i cannot imagine the level of stress that i would feel if that was my retirement savings in those accounts like i would be i would just be dead i would have had a heart attack i would be like passed out on the floor so you know when you're deciding what kind of investor you have to be deciding your risk tolerance is a really important part of this equation you know like do you want to be like awakened at night worrying about like is my investment safe you know like i i personally don't but a lot of people kind of love that thrill a lot of people love the thrill of like oh i'm gonna beat the market i'm gonna make so much money blah 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 so you know crypto for me is a hard pass um and i would say if you are going to invest in crypto like god bless i'm impressed but do not invest your retirement savings in crypto like I would only invest like my quote unquote mad money in crypto, right? Like I think a few of us have like a few hundred dollars or maybe if we're really lucky, a few thousand dollars that we like kind of play with in the markets. So if you, if you're, if you have that little side fund to play with, go for crypto, see what happens, but do not, do not put your financial future in the hands of crypto. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, someone here is saying, you know, what if your employer offers for a 401k and matching, but you'd rather have your money in brokerage accounts because it may be some of the things you've already told us. Yeah. So um, 401k matching is something that you should never, ever pass up, in my opinion, because it's literally free money. Like if your company is matching like 3%, then that's like you're basically getting a salary boost every year by by taking that money. Um, so I would say personally, always start in your 401k. I was, I was, I was invested in a 401k for many, many years before I started investing in my brokerage account. Um, because that match, like whatever you have to do to contribute enough to get the match, you've got to do it because that's free money. That's, that's like a salary boost that you are immediately getting with that 401k match. So I would do that first, like 100% do that first, like before you invest in a brokerage account. Great, thank you. Uh, one of the attendees is, is uh, referring here to the having to adjust your portfolio, right, periodically. I uh -huh. wonder how often, how often do you have to do that? And did you mention some types of investments where maybe that's not as much of a concern? So there are the target date funds that we talked about with which are a mutual fund and they automatically allocate like risk based on how close you are to retirement. So if you are invested in a target date fund, you don't have to do anything, which is part of the reason why target date funds are so popular because people kind of got tired of rebalancing. But but sometimes your portfolio will just get out of whack without you really doing anything, right? Like because you might have things, this is a little bit kind of like high level, but you might have something in your portfolio set up that says, you know, sell these stocks if the price falls below X amount. And if the price falls below X amount, invest in bonds, right? That could be something that you set up in your portfolio when you open it. And in 10 years time, well, things have, will have shifted, right? Things will have moved around and you're going to need to look at it again. So, you know, you you can set yourself up in a few different ways. If you do the target date fund, you really don't ever have to look at it. Um, but if you do the brokerage account, like we were just talking about, you will need to look at it and make sure that things like haven't shifted around. Excellent, thank you. And then uh, someone here, I mean, we had a couple of questions about uh, life insurance, uh, whether it's it's one way to invest. Somebody's asking, can you use life insurance? cash value as a leverage to purchase assets and then if, if, we, if you could also address term life insurance and how that is often recommended for 
lower income families who, uh, you know, want the lowest cost but still want to leave something for their kids should they should they pass away early. Right, right. No, life insurance is, is a very important um, part of the picture. I'll start with term life insurance because it's a little easier. It's it's cheaper. It's more affordable for people, which is why it's often recommended. Um, but it is literally just good for the term. So you can get a 15 year term, a 10 year term, a 30 year term, and you pay your premiums. And if you die at any point over that period, if you have a 30 year term life insurance and you die after 20 years or 25 years, whatever it is, your heirs will be paid. You, they will be paid whatever amount you took that out that policy for. But at the end of that 30 years, you have nothing right? You have not been accumulating an, an asset at all. And I kind of think of this like renting versus buying a house. Like term life insurance is you are a renter. You are renting an insurance policy. And at the end of that policy, like that's it, you move out, your policy is done. But with a cash value life insurance or permanent life insurance, you're going to pay a lot more per month but you are building cash value. And that cash value, to the question asker's point, can be used for a variety of purposes, including retirement, college funding, estate planning, whatever it is. Basically, cash value life insurance works by investing the premiums into like a pool of investments. And you don't have to worry about it, but, but that's what your insurance policy does. And these investments go, grow over time and the cash value of your policy is gonna grow too. And you can access the cash value of your policy at any time um, and borrow against it if you need to. And a lot of people like a cash value policy because you can borrow against it without any sort of a penalty, which is really nice. Um, and cash value insurance can be a great way to grow your savings. Um, you just got to know if you borrow against it, if you have a $300,000 life insurance policy and you borrow $100,000 from it and then you die, your your heirs are only going to get two hundred thousand dollars, right? Because you just borrowed a hundred thousand dollars of it. So um, it can be great, but if you take money out of it, you got to put that money back in if you expect your kids or your heirs to receive like the full amount. Um, but yes, to uh, cash value life insurance is is also a wonderful savings vehicle for yourself or for your heirs. Great, thank you. Uh, somebody's asking, is it ever uh, a good to use home equity to invest when you are house rich but have no liquid liquid funds um i don't know that i would make that decision i mean i, I think it the home equity lines of credit are, are very complicated right and i think in this interest rate market it's not a good idea to refinance because interest rates are so high i, I think it would depend on the circumstances one is a little hard to answer without knowing like how much the house is worth and like what the interest rates are right but but in general i would say i would say no okay great thank you uh, and then just getting a little bit deeper into some of the terms uh someone's here is, is asking if you could talk a little bit about margins um because they they can be a problem for investors who don't realize that that involves a loan. Um, wow. So this would take, I don't know that I, we're like three minutes until time. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if we have time to go into that, but basically, um, margins are like when you borrow from your broker to buy stocks. Um, so margins are, are considered a risky investment. So so if you're if you're just like me, if you're just Catherine or you're just Linda and you're just like on your brokerage account and you are buying a stock, you don't have to worry about margins. Um so so whoever's asking this question has a lot of experience playing the market, which is great. Um but I don't think this is something that the novice investor is necessarily going to count going to encounter right away great thank you thank you and then of course like we said before uh, folks can reach out to us and we can try to get you questions that we didn't get to um just the, the last question i guess folks are a couple of people asked 
about you know the different types of brokerages, et cetera. But one of the questions is, are younger people choosing different types of ways to invest versus older? Is there something going on now with you know younger folks that hasn't been done in the past? And is it is there any are there recommendations around that? Mm -hmm. I mean, younger, it's a good question. Younger people are more likely to invest in stocks and ETFs and mutual funds, which is all the things that we talked about. Older investors are like more likely to invest in bonds and CDs because I think they want a little more stability. Um, but I, I would say the younger investors in the stocks, the ETFs and the mutual funds is like right where they need to be. Um, and again, if you're in a target date fund that automatically adjusts based on your age, then that fund is going to give you exactly what you need over the course of your whole life. Um, so yeah, we do see more younger people invested in, in those just because I think they can take a little bit more risk. Um, and I do think just like culturally, we've seen a lot of younger people invested in crypto because, you know, I think this is what always happens when there's some new flavor of the week investment, right? Like all the young people are like, oh, I'll try that. Um, but I think I think to have your money in stocks, ETFs, and mutual funds is is fantastic. Well, great. Thank you, Catherine. I will uh, turn it back to Linda and and then thank you uh, for offering to get that. If we get questions later, that we can get them to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that sounds fantastic. And uh, like I said, you guys can always uh, find us at harmony.com. Would love to see you there. Linda, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Nelson. And thank you, Catherine, for that great presentation and for hanging in there and answering the questions. Audience, I think I mentioned earlier that Catherine is the author of the book, How to Money, and she has graciously agreed to give us two books to raffle off, as well as two t-shirts. So the names of everyone in attendance today will be placed in a hat and two lucky people will receive a free copy of her book. How about that? Catherine, thank you again. It was an honor to have you uh, uh, with us today. Again, a special thanks to our sponsor. Consumer Action is offering a series of free trainings on financial wellness in order to narrow the financial literacy and confidence gap for women and communities of color. NASDAQ has graciously provided us with funding for the webinars and the multilingual guides that I described earlier. So go to our website and uh, download uh, those uh, guides. Now, if you would like to contribute to Consumer Action, you can do so online uh, by credit card or PayPal by going to www.consumer-action.org slash giving. Or you can mail us a check to Consumer Action, Attention, Membership, Giving, 57 Post Street, Suite 611, San Francisco, California, 94104. If you don't have a check, uh, no worries. What you can do is uh, you can support us by uh, subscribing to our uh, YouTube uh, channel. It would help us continue uh, bringing you these great webinars. Speaking of great webinars, um, our second webinar will be on uh, April the 25th. You can register for uh, that uh, webinar now. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say about our webinar today. So please complete the survey and get that back to us. Also, the link to the PowerPoint slides to the recording will be released uh, for you tomorrow. Uh, thank you again to Catherine. Please join me in sending her the love. And thank you for joining us today. And thank you for your uh, support. Thank you for your service. Thank you for the things that you do. Um, that's all for now. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.